Philip Sneed. I've been, um, I'm, I'm so pleased about this uh, event. I'm pleased to see so many people here. Um, this session is going to be different than anything you've seen before. And uh, starting with the music that you heard as you were coming in, you've been listening to Philip Glass's Symphony No. 6, Plutonian Ode. And that was based on the Allen Ginsberg poem of the same name, um, which you will hear uh, excerpts of uh, later um, uh, during this panel session. Philip Glass wrote the piece um, inspired by the Allen Ginsberg work, which was, of course, inspired by his time at Rocky Flats. And um, part of the, the vocal part that you've been listening to is actually uh, a vocal, vocal music that's set to the text that Allen Ginsberg wrote. So um, I have been framing these sessions with a series of questions for people to ponder, questions like how much secrecy do we need to provide for the national defense, what is the role of whistleblowers in a democratic society, etc. And I've been ending with the very provocative question, what is the role of artists in helping to affect change? Does their work make any difference at all? And I'm hoping that this panel will put that, um, put that question to rest. I would just I'd like to extend uh, thanks once again to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and John and Carol Balcom as our primary sponsor. And um, I hope the other sponsors will forgive me for uh, saving time by not mentioning them at this session, but that you'll find them in the program. I do want to draw your attention, though, to the exhibition in our History Museum, um, which is called Rocky Flats in History, Art, and Memory, because you'll see additional uh, artworks um, in that exhibition, as well as artifacts from Rocky Flats, as well as press clippings, photos, etc. So uh, the art continues continues with that uh, down in the exhibition, which is up for three months. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce this moderator, uh, today's moderator, Brian Taylor, professor at the University of Colorado. Brian. Thank you, Philip. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here and an honor to share the stage with um, our artists and performers today. Our panelists today include several distinguished artists, authors, and performers whose work over the years has depicted Rocky Flats and its legacies. Collectively, their work demonstrates how art has functioned in the nuclear age to perform at least three functions. The first function has been to provide images and stories that enable us to engage and to cope with the traumatic paradox of nuclear weapons. Namely, that an instrument developed for our national security would also threaten to produce our global annihilation. The second function of nuclear art has been to question our collective responsibility for participating in the political, economic, and social systems which contribute to the development of nuclear weapons. Here, art challenges us to fully consider our motives, to remember what we have taken for granted, and to consider alternative means of achieving our security. Finally, nuclear art has uniquely expressed the aesthetic and spiritual qualities of human experience that may otherwise be lost in the dominant, literal, and rational languages of nuclear politics and science. Here, nuclear art bears witness to persistent qualities such as beauty, mystery, suffering, and transcendence surrounding nuclear weapons that modern society has deemed irrelevant, wasteful, or taboo. In this way, nuclear art offers us alternative systems of truth that invite us to become whole again. Our panelists today will be presenting in two groups. I will introduce the performers in each group and they will make their individual presentations. Please feel free to applaud following each presentation. I regret that time will not permit us to hold a public question and answer session afterwards. However, there are at least three ways that you can interact with our presenters today. First, they will be available for at least a few minutes after the panel if you wish to come up afterwards and talk to them. Second, several of the presenters host individual websites, enabling you to email them or to post your responses. Finally, the Arvado Center is planning on creating a public forum on the web which will permit audiences for these panels uh, to post their response. Turning now to our first group of presenters, Carol Gallagher is a documentary photographer and author of the acclaimed volume, American Ground Zero, The Secret Nuclear War. This work collected images, personal narratives, official history, and investigative commentary concerning the effects of radioactive fallout generated by Cold War era above ground nuclear testing on US citizens, DOE complex workers, and their survivors. She has recently been working on several book projects whose topics include the environmental consequences of the 1991 Persian Gulf War and of nuclear testing in the American West. 
Second, Robert Del Tredici is a photographer whose work as both an independent artist and a consultant has systematically depicted the key facilities of the US nuclear weapons complex. He was principal photographer and art designer for three US Department of Energy reports on the planned post-Cold War cleanup of contaminated complex facilities. In the process, he documented Rocky Flats on three separate occasions. He is also the founder of the Atomic Photographers Guild. Third, John Craig Freeman is a public artist with over 25 years of experience using emergent technologies to produce large-scale public works at sites where the forces of globalization are impacting the lives of individuals in local communities. His work seeks to expand the notion of the public by exploring how digital networked technology is transforming our sense of place. In November 1990, he created Operation Green Run 2, consisting of 11 10 feet by 40 foot billboards near the front gate of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapon plant. Finally, Barbara, forgive me, Donashi? Donaki, Donakai? Barbara Donakai has a Bachelor of Fine Arts and Masters of Public Health degrees. She was US Director of Potters for Peace for eight years, where she was engaged in the research, training, and evaluation of a locally produced home use ceramic water filter. Between 1982 and 1993, she designed and coordinated the production and exhibition at 17 locations of Amber Waves of Grain, a 32,000 piece clay replica of the US nuclear arsenal, and Twilight's Last Gleaming, an equally large depiction of volumes of plutonium and nuclear waste. Carol. Thank you, Brian. It's good to meet you after 20 years again. Um, and I want to thank everybody involved in this really gigantic event, which is so exciting and, and so interesting and moves us to work harder in doing what we do. Great. Um, a few days ago, I came across a quote from the revered African-American writer James Baldwin and I want to begin my presentation today with this. The purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. My second quote, which I looked for after I read that one, is, it is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Many years ago, when I was a kid in, in grammar school, I was in a monastery. Um, one of the nuns said to me, if you see something and do nothing about it, you are as guilty as the perpetrator. And this uh, guided me and worked on me throughout my childhood with the duck and cover exercises in the monastery. And I began to wonder what happened to those who lived near the atmospheric tests that I would see on the cover of New York Daily News or read about. And that's uh, what I found out about when I moved to Utah in 1983 to begin work on my book, American Ground Zero. Uh, first slide. This is Ken Case, the atomic cowboy, as he was called by the press, seen holding a foot-high branding iron in 1963, the cover photo of test site news. One of Case's duties was to herd cattle over the atomic range, particularly over ground zero areas, in an animal experimentation program whose existence is denied to routine visitors to the test site. Next. Here he is uh, guiding cattle over the test site grounds, uh, which were massively contaminated, so the dust would come up. And he said, uh, they got cancer and we got cancer, only the animals were so much closer to the ground that they died faster. Go ahead. This is Ken Case shortly before his death holding a photo of one of the tests he witnessed, which hung on the wall of a trailer he lived in in North Las Vegas, right over a plate with a poem on it, To Mother, glazed with pink roses. 
He was a kindly bear of a man, and at the time of our interview, his cancer had spread throughout most of the organs of his body, and he and his wife, fervent Mormons, passed on a year later in 1985. Next. Uh, next. Okay, that's good. Um, this is what people in St. George, Utah, which the officials say was plastered with fallout, looked like at the time. This was Main Street and St. George Boulevard in Utah, St. George, photographed by the esteemed uh, photographer Dorothea Lang, who is a personal hero of mine. Uh, from now on, I'm going to go through the downwinders, just mentioning who they are and the atomic vets, so I can get to the workers who would be most relevant to most of you here. So you keep going. And this is uh, a fallout cloud approaching a ranch uh, just north of the test site. You can see the cloud very clearly there. Next. Next. Downwinder, downwinder. Sorry, downwinders. More downwinders. This is... Um, Marvel and Walter Adkins. Uh, Walter Adkins was a victim of uh, very safe underground nuclear testing. Uh, he was caught in the uh, effluent of Bainbury in December 1970, which blew out of the ground. And he was a bus driver at the test site who just stood uh, sitting against the, the head of his bus, looking at the fallout come over and he said, um, mom, 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 mom. Yep. well, he said that it came, came over looking like pink dust, and it settled on his hands and all over everyone. He was on the outside, and when they took him into the shower uh, to get him cleaned off, they put the, the Geiger counter against him. He said, ooh, it liked to flew out of the box, that needle, and he was so contaminated that they had to wash him maybe 20 times in ice cold water because the hot water had broken down. And they still didn't get all the radiation out of him, nor out of his car parked at the test site. Uh, they steamed it for nine weeks and still they couldn't get the radiation out. Next. This is Bonnie McDaniels, a test site worker with her mother, Marjorie Lease and a picture of her father and Marjorie's husband uh, as he lay dying of a throat cancer. They said, the cancer started in his throat, it was real sore. We went to our own doctor who said, you have a sore throat, I'll give you antibiotics. He took them for six weeks, didn't improve, went to a specialist who said, all I can tell you is you sure have a sore throat, I'll give you some antibiotics. We told him we already had some. It kept getting worse and worse. Finally, desperate, I looked up one in the phone book. We went in right away, and he said, I sure don't like what I see. I want you in the hospital tomorrow morning for a biopsy. So they biopsied him. They took out his larynx, and she said they took his whole head off almost. When he came out of surgery, he looked like a mummy. He was so wrapped up, and he didn't come to for a few days. Uh, Hapleys, uh, short for happy, uh, worked at the test site for 14 years since 1962, and he was a radiation monitor, so he was the first to go into the underground tunnels after an underground test to me take the measurements. Uh, and he said, there were some areas up there that was infected with plutonium so bad it will never be fit for anything. Nobody dare go there because there's so much pl plutonium. There have been so many guys that died that worked up in there. Next. This is test site worker Rex Tomlinson. Uh, he was really striking, yellow blonde hair, celadon green eyes, very powerful physique, and he had been a mercenary in Central America before working at the test site, and he worked at the test site for 20 years. He first declined to be interviewed for fear of losing his job, but I asked him when he finally spoke to me, why run weapons to Central America, and why face the perils of radiation? day after day at the test site. It all seemed so dangerous to me. They both paid well, he said, smiling. In pursuit of the dollar, Rex Tomlinson took risk as it came. Next. Herman Hagen was also a strapping six-foot-tall test site worker who would just dip his arm to the elbow in radioactive wastewater and say, see, it can't hurt you. 
whittled down from his normal weight of 220 pounds to 78 pounds when I met him. He was confined to his deathbed with multiple myeloma, cancer of the bone marrow, for four years. He maintained that the wages at the test site were a good living, a great living, the best in the state of Nevada outside of organized crime. And so when I said to him, don't you think maybe this is organized crime? He laughed and he actually, his skin was so tight pushed, pulled against his bones that he started to bleed and you can see some of the blood spots on, on the actual bed sheets. Next. This is atomic veteran Robert Carter with his uh, group of soldiers right before a nuclear test just a few miles from ground zero. Next. This is a very faded out picture of uh, atomic veteran Fred Wareheim. Next. For the, uh, I'm thinking of Charles McKay uh, now because this is a picture of McRae Bullock, who is uh, the lead case in Bullock versus USA, who lost so many of his herds uh, because in the winter they would feed right close to the, to the east of the test site. And the, when they led the uh, herds home, the, cow, the sheep would drop in their tracks and their muzzles would be burned from, uh, from eating the radiation contaminated range. So his case was the bellwether case against the government for the loss of so many herds uh, on the fallout covered range. Next. These are the sheep sheds where the sheep would just fall down on the ground uh, so contaminated even before they were born uh, that they died almost instantly. Next. This is an abandoned sheep wagon in Cedar City, the kind of structure they lived in while they were next to the test site. Next. This is McRae Bullock. Uh, loved the guy. Next. This is uh, downwinder Jay Truman. Next. This is his mother in, in her casket, Della Truman. Next. This is Sedan Crater at the Nevada test site. This is underground nuclear testing, perfectly safe. It's set, set off so many, it was July 6, 1962, a hydrogen bomb of 104 kilotons, nine times the size of the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. It dug a crater 320 feet deep and released such enormous amounts of radiation into Utah that scientists at the University of Utah re reported in an issue of Science Magazine that from that one shot alone, children's thyroids were exposed to far more than the permissible dose of iodine-131. Next. Just two more. This is an empty schoolyard in Amargosa Valley, about five, year, five miles south of the test site. Next. Uh, this is an atomic street sign. Uh, they called at streets atomic as they were building their new homes right near the test site. And I'm sure you can relate to that about the homes building, built close to um, Rocky Flats. They actually had street signs that said atomic street. Next. Yep. Did I do it in time? I had my 13 minutes of fame. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I just want you to know that if you want to read American Ground Zero, it's in libraries and you can find it online uh, for about five bucks for the paperback. So um, I, I do suggest you read it and look at the pictures more closely because uh, it's 70 years of history that I'm trying to put into 13 minutes and it doesn't work all that well. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. This is a great conference and I'm proud to be part of it. I'm a photographer drawn to people, places, and things that are loaded with meaning, hidden from view, and tangled up in lies. That's why I like the nuclear weapons industry. 
I have 13 minutes, so I'm going to go into haiku mode. So let's talk about Rocky Flats, then and now. There in the distance, back in the day, way back then, this is the plant that the Cold War made. A mighty factory, one of a kind, top secret, isolated by empty space. In the foreground of the photograph is the ongoing now, giving new meaning to the phrase, if you build it and leave a lot of empty land around it, they will come. This is a development of Superior. There have since been more developments, Candelis and Whisper Creek. Of course, there's no worry about contamination living so close to Rocky Flats, but if you move into Superior, you do have to sign a waiver saying that if there is contamination on your property, you're responsible for it. Back in the day, this is the thing that the plant had made. It's the pit, it's the core, it's the explosive heart of the bomb. This picture shows the amount of, not, of plutonium in the Nagasaki bomb. It's not plutonium, it's a glass paperweight held by Richard Rhodes. But the amount hasn't substantially changed in a modern warhead. Yet in the Nagasaki bomb, only a penny weight's worth of plutonium fissioned to create the destruction on that day. The rest of it was blown apart by the force of the bomb. Now they know how to hold all of it together until all of it fissions. So the same amount of plutonium is far more um, explosive and powerful. Back in the day, the more bombs you made, the safer you became. At the height of the Cold War, we had 25,000 nuclear warheads. And our panel artist, Barbara Donakai, wondered, what would 25,000 warheads look like? And this is her answer. For our arsenal, to make this possible, Rocky Flats made 70,000 pits. If you do the math, that's 50 pits a day, seven days a week, for 37 years. That was then. This is now, and it was then, and it is basically forever. We've heard that radiation is invisible. Not so, not quite. Here you see a particle of plutonium in the lung tissue of an ape. It's true, you can't see the actual particle, but what you are seeing are the bursts of alpha radiation over a 48-hour period that coming off that particle. Now, alpha is not penetrating radiation. It can be stopped by a single sheet of paper. But if you inhale it or it enters your system one way or another, those, there are 10,000 cells in the spiky radius of this particle, and they are getting a heavy dose. This kind of radiation is called the weak force, as opposed to the strong force of the exploding bomb. But the Cree nation in northern Manitoba, I asked them once, what is your word for radiation? And they, they translated it as, that which keeps on exploding. That's their term for radiation. And it keeps on exploding for a quarter of a million years. So if you sweep it under the rug, it will long outlast any rug you would bury it under. This is the man who back in the day, in 1974, was director of the Jefferson County Health Department. In that county is Rocky Flats. In 1974, he was approached by the county commissioners 
who asked if it would be wise to build a housing development just east of Rocky Flats, and they funded him to do a study. Now, Carl Johnson understood something about plutonium, that its dangerous, most dangerous form is in respirable dust. Not so much so buried in the earth, but when you can inhale it. So, he created a revolutionary method of checking the site. The standard method was to scrape the topsoil a quarter of an inch and then subject that to analysis. But in that quarter of an inch, you had rocks and gravel, and these diluted the measurements of the radiation. So Carl Johnson's approach was to monitor, collect only the respirable dust. He used a vacuum cleaner and used a soft brush. And um, he came up with findings that were on average 40 times more plutonium than the state itself found using its method in the very same place. When he reported his findings, the housing project was canceled. Now the commissioners did not appreciate this, and the state brought in the grand old man of nuclear safety, Carl Ziegler Morgan, the father of health physics, the science of radiation safety. He had been hired uh, at the beginning of the Manhattan Project to determine how much radiation can workers safely tolerate if they're handling uranium and plutonium. Carl has a melancholy look in his eye because, first of all, he learned by extensive experiments with animals and other studies that there is no safe level of radiation, that even a tiny dose can be the one that damages your cell, that starts the process of it growing out of control. Now the commissioners asked Carl Morgan, they brought him in and they wanted Carl to reassess Johnson's work. So he did so. And when it was time for Carl Morgan's report, he came down on the side of Carl Johnson. He said, Carl Johnson is correct. This affirmation of his work did not keep Carl Johnson from being fired, revised, forgotten, and erased. And yet I think his spirit is coming back because his new method back then is very now, today. This is a keep out sign at the welcome dump just a few miles north of Port Hope, a town in Canada with the world's largest and oldest refinery of uranium products. There's another sign on the gate. It says, welcome dump, keep out. <laughs> I saw this picture and it just hit me right between the chromosomes that this disintegration, this is it. This is what we're up against with products that have such a long life. It happens over time. And it's always been part of the problem. The long latencies of radiation-induced cancers, anywhere up to 40 years. But just because we cannot see it or even feel it, it doesn't mean it isn't happening. Here's another safety sign at the plutonium finishing plant at Hanford. Two seconds, safety thought. Grim Reaper. Two seconds, eh? I thought, well, what, how about a 20,000 year safety thought? What's the big rush here? Well, we're rushing to build bombs to protect ourselves from those other bombs built by those other people who are building bombs to protect themselves from our bombs. That's the logic of the bomb. 
And it's given us a big rush in more ways than one. This is a statue of the Buddha that was in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, directly under the explosion. And the pulse of heat emitted from the airborne explosion was hot enough to melt bronze. And yet it's only partially melted because it's was a very brief pulse of heat. I showed this picture to a Russian poet and he said, this is your greatest photograph because it shows that not even the gods are immune to nuclear weapons. They are vulnerable. And the survivors of Hiroshima that I talked to told me something that I will not forget. They said, nuclear weapons and human beings cannot coexist. And I thought about that, and I thought, yeah, but, but, we, but we are coexisting. We have lots of nuclear weapons. So I thought maybe there's another level of meaning to this statement, because it's felt right. And I concluded that if you hold in your hand the power of a nuclear weapon, and you are willing to annihilate a whole species because of one kind of disagreement or another, and they're willing to do the same to you. I'm afraid that your humanity has been lost. Nuclear weapons rob us of our humanity. This is a picture I call the Maids of Muslimovo, taken outside uh, the Chelyabinsk plutonium production reactor in Chelyabinsk, Russia. And they have these looks on their faces because they are watching Westerners for the very first time sample the water in their river that flows past their town, the Techa River. This town is 35 kilometers downstream from the Chelyabinsk plutonium reactor where the Russians, the Soviets, in such a hurry to build that bomb to catch up with the Americans that they dumped high-level nuclear waste into the Techa River for four years. The water turned black. Many people fell ill. Doctors were said to not speak of radiation, but to inform the inhabitants that they had vegetative syndrome. And I like that picture because it's also a picture of us. I will conclude now. I tried to begin in a haiku style. I thought I should end with a koan. A koan is a short phrase like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or what is the face you had before your father was born? So my koan is, what is the sound coming <laughs> What is the sound coming, coming out of the face of the future unborn when they learn the hard way in their own new now time that the plutonium left in the ground back in the then time was for many different reasons left there on purpose? I think that sound the unborn face might make will come in the form of a curse. But as long as we still have a now, we still have a chance to deflect that curse and dodge it from the future if we do the right thing. Thank you.
Not sure how to follow that. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. First, I, I just want to thank uh, uh, all of my fellow panelists here. I'm really honored to be part of this. Uh, also, to thank uh, Larry Borowski and uh, Connie Bogart and uh, Philip Sneed and all of the staff here at the center and Barbara uh, Donachie for opening her home to me and uh, friends and colleagues and everybody else who came today uh, just to discuss these important, important issues. Uh, in the late 1980s, I came to the University of Colorado Boulder to pursue my Master's of Fine Arts degree and my interest in using emergent technology to invent new forms of interventionist public art addressing the great human rights and environmental issues of our time. Before I had arrived in Boulder, a group of environmentalists known as the Citizens Against Billboards on Highway 93 had organized a su successful boycott against a group of billboards that were just lined up just to in a row just outside the front gates of the Rocky Flats plant. The ads located along one of the most scenic parts of the drive along the front range of the Rocky Mountains were considered an eyesore. Plutonium, plutonium contamination is of course invisible. Unable to convince local businesses to advertise on the billboards, the owner was driven out of business and the billboard structures stood empty for several years. This image shows the proximity of the billboard structures to the Rocky Flats plant with the water tower in the distance and the Denver skyline just 12 miles downwind. You may recall the operators of the plants made sure that, that it remained nondescript. It had no image. When the issue surfaced in the media, the most uh, common image was a fuzzy telephoto shot of the water tower on the horizon. I recognized the billboard's potential for public art and began making proposals using early Macintosh desktop computing technology. And at that point, I met Jason Salzman of Greenpeace and they agreed to fund the production of the project. Operation Green Run 2, my thesis project at the university consisted of 11 10 by 40 foot billboard faces made up of 2,000 individual bitmap images per billboard printed on an early uh, desktop computing system on, on a simple office laser printer, the emerging technology of the time. The university gave me an old racquetball court to use as a studio. And keep in mind that the commercial billboards were hand painted at this time. The technology to print a billboard would not exist for another five years. We hired a crane crew to hang the completed work on location. Over the course of about a mile, the billboards read, today we made a 250,000 year commitment. This is in sequence along northbound Highway 93. And this is uh, southbound side. Building more bombs is a nuclear waste. With images from the Operation Baker of 1946 off the coast of Bikini Atoll. On a beautiful Indian summer morning on November 14, 1990, we unveiled the project to, to the public and the press. Rocky Flats plant. They graphically warn about what Greenpeace calls the toxic effects of Rocky Flats. Kim Christensen reports it started a battle among people who are on the same side. They depict the nuclear nightmare, a fluorescent warning of the dangers posed by Rocky Flats. Greenpeace says the company that owns the billboards offered them for six months free of charge. Along with the CU Art Department, Greenpeace created what it calls an environmental art project. But to some Boulder residents, they're an eyesore. They say a billboard is still a billboard. I don't know whether they're environmental nitwits or environmental traitors. It is it, the right message. That is, we agree with closing Rocky Flats, but it's clearly the wrong medium. These billboards are a blight on the landscape. If we don't get this plant closed, the view of the Boulder Flatirons from Highway 93 is going to be the least of their worries. 
The billboards not only ask people to think about Rocky Flats, they want them to do something. They suggest that you call Governor Romer and ask him to take some action. About 10,000 people will drive past their message every day. Greenpeace hopes it'll keep Rocky Flats closed. Opponents want that too, but not this way. At the Greenpeace news conference, both sides got into a shouting match. Don't do Rocky Flats! Don't do it 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 Rocky Flats! Don't Sounds like they need some cheerleaders out there. Last night, the Boulder City Council passed a resolution to send a letter of protest to Greenpeace. Boulder Mayor Leslie Durgan says the letter will say, in essence, it is the right message, but the wrong way to say it. That, that usually lightens the atmosphere a little bit. <laughs> Ed Sardella. Uh, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I was trying to ask this question earlier this morning, but, uh, but the final decision to uh, shut down the plutonium operations for good and to shift the efforts of Rocky Flats to clean up were, was uh, taken uh, uh, not because of the certainly much larger global forces at play and the hard work of all of the people, many of who are in this room, uh, but during the time that, uh, uh, during the fire, media firestorm that followed uh, the, the, this project. Um, the, this conference has been talking a lot about the, uh, the, the, the raid as if it was the end game, but uh, the reality was is that uh, it was just a suspension after the raid and that, the, as I understand it, that the budget was, was slated to increase 20% uh, in 1990. And so I'd, I'd, if uh, there's opportunity for the rest of the conference to kind of address the actual closure of the plant, I think it would be useful because I'd like to know more about it myself. Uh, six months later, after a winter of Chinook winds, uh, the media was invited back as Jason Salzman of Greenpeace and Tom Lustig of Citizens Against Billboards on High Highway 93 shook hands, and I think that, uh, that Tom Lustig joined Greenpeace. And uh, in a great symbolic gesture, the billboard structures were disassembled and removed for good. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> You can tell I'm not the technology person that Craig is. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Barbara Donakai. It's Donakai. Nobody ever says it right. Um, and I'm. When it's, 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 it's cycling. Can you stop it from cycling? And we can step back. Can I just make it go? Okay, thank you. Um, this is sort of a story of a process for, that went into making an exhibit because, um, you know, nothing really, uh, the beginning really starts at a different place sometimes than where we think it starts. 
Um, going back to like 1955 when I lived in New Jersey with my brother and we grew up in the um, duck and cover era. No, it's still, it's still doing this. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go again. Um, we grew up in the duck and cover era in New Jersey, and um, no, I'm still doing it. Um, it's, it's still doing it. I don't know. Okay, that's my time. <laughs> okay, you knew I grew up in New Jersey. Um, uh, we saw movies in the basement of my elementary school uh, about what nuclear blasts could do. And considering that we lived about 15 miles from the Philadelphia Navy Yard, even at the age of uh, seven, I had a pretty good idea of what that meant. Um, the images that we weren't shown ever in our classroom were the images of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, I'm going to fast forward to 1981, and that's the year that, um, in, her, in, her, in the interim, I got a master's degree or a bachelor's degree in fine arts with a major in ceramics. So that's my media. So it may, might make more sense to you knowing that. Uh, in 1981, I went to. Um, Europe with uh, my partner, Europe and Asia, right after Ronald Reagan made this statement about a limited nuclear war in Europe. Um, but in Europe, that wasn't considered limited at all. And there was already a very strong anti-nuclear movement in place. Um, we, this is the women of Greenham Common. Uh, as we traveled around through Asia and Europe, people started asking us questions about the United States government and military policy and nuclear weapons and cruise missiles and Pershing missiles. This is even this was a rickshaw driver in uh, in India, uh, and um, they wanted to know about it. And we didn't know anything. We didn't. We knew nothing. Absolutely nothing. So uh, when, this is a photo from Japan, it was our last stop before we came home. And in Japan, I had a very disturbingly real and profound dream that nuclear war had happened. It, it, was star it had started. And I knew that it was the beginning of the end. And I, I won't go into the details of that dream, but it was terrifyingly real. And when I woke up, it felt like, you know, a second chance. So when we came back to Denver early 1982, we started working with the nuclear freeze campaign. And that was a, a nuclear freeze was a bilateral freeze, the U.S.-Soviet, on the production of U.S. and Soviet nuclear weapons. And we organized events. We organized a freeze nuclear arms race and um, it started up a, helped start up a speaker's bureau and put a lot of effort into raising awareness. And in the process, I came up with questions like, well, what, I, I started doing research. I wanted to find out more about what we had. And the resources were, um, these were our resources, a wonderful bulletin of atomic scientists that have sponsored this. 
And uh, Jane's Book of All the World's Weapons, which is an interesting thing if you can find it at your library. It's like a Sears catalog. It's about like three inches thick of uh, weapons all around the world. It's very sobering. And uh, Center for Defense Information was a great resource. Uh, United States Air Force and the United States Department of Defense. And uh, many got information from many of the weapons contractors. So what I learned at the end of that approximate year of doing research was that we had 12,000 strategic nuclear warheads, 15 to 20,000 tactical on 1,000 ICBMs, 640 submarine launch missiles, and some 3,500 cruise missiles and that world megatonnage exceeded one million times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. That was, this was in 1982. And that the triggers for all of these were made, um, have been made at the 30,000 triggers for the ones that were, these were the ones that were actually de deployed, ready to be used, 30,000, have been made at Rocky Flats. Uh, I looked for an image. So I decided that in order to uh, really get what this was about, I needed to make it. <laughs> so I started putting out that idea of re replicating the U.S. nuclear arsenal to friends and family and got a lot of interest and support, so we kind of went ahead. I used the image of a, um, the cone shape image of a um, warhead that is on, a, uh, on the intercontinental ballistic missiles as the uh, icon for all nuclear weapons. And we turned our second floor of our house into a production studio, and we enlisted our family and friends and fellow travelers in casting 30,000 pieces. Um, we used six tons of clay slip. We did 17 firings in a quite large uh, gas-fired kill. We had 70 volunteers, and it took about 8,000 work hours to make the exhibit and do set up the first um, show. And um, the first show was in uh, New York City, and we had never set up the whole show before. So when we set it up, we got these beautiful patterns, and someone looked at it and said, wow, that looks like a wheat field from, from the air. So... Uh, we ended up naming it Amber Waves of Grain. Uh, in the subsequent uh, ten, eight or nine years or so, we set the exhibit up in 17 locations. And one of the most wonderful things was each location we worked with groups of volunteers, and they came from churches and organizations and uh, just interested people, sometimes high schools, even elementary schools would help set up. Um, some of the, uh, for the exhibit that we did in Washington, D.C., some of the exhibits were people that came over from the State Department on their lunch hours, so we never knew who was going to show up. But what was lovely, really lovely, was the interaction that the volunteers who were setting up the exhibit were able to have with the people who were watching and were able to talk about it and share all of their, share their feelings. So these are all the exhibits, and I'm not going to read them to you, but um, it was a lot of work, and it was an incredible experience. Uh, these are the shows set up, the completed shows. This is in Davidson College in North Carolina. This is the Rockford Art Museum in Rockford, Illinois. This was at the National Mall in Washington, D.C., with a Capitol in the background. This was um, the Boston Science Museum in Boston. And this was Civic Center Plaza in San Francisco. So all in all, we gathered uh, 5, 000, about 5,000 comments of people, did 75 in media interviews as of 1986. And there were hundreds of thousands of viewers over the course of all these shows. And um, it was interesting because, especially on the out outdoor shows, people didn't go to see it. They just happened upon it. So uh, in uh, 1989, as you all know, um, the Cold well, the Soviet Union dissolved, and the Cold War ostensibly ended, and production soon after start stopped at Rocky Flats for whatever reasons. 
And I started looking at the issues of nuclear waste, like what was going to happen with all this stuff. And uh, found that there was, doing some research, I found that we had uh, 10 million cubic feet of transuranic nuclear waste. That's nuclear waste that's mixed with, that's stuff that's mixed with plutonium. It could be motor oil, it could be oil, it could be gloves, suits, whatever. Uh, we had 13 million feet of cubic, uh, cubic feet of high level waste and 100 metric tons of plutonium with a half life of 24,000 years. So um, I used the image of the uh, plutonium buttons, which have been mentioned earlier, as an icon to represent a volume of nuclear waste. These are the um, pieces that um, I came up with that we cast to represent volumes of nuclear waste plutonium and nuclear waste. And this was a show that was at the, um, in San Francisco. We did, uh, this was exhibited about five times until 1994, at which point I burned out. <laughs> and also I think the, everything had kind of changed. So um, my observations over this period of time was that this exhibit really spoke to the general public. People especially the amber waves exhibit, people got it, like one, one cone equals one warhead equals one Hiroshima, and people have an image for that. Um, the image of the exhibit didn't turn people away, they were kind of intrigued by it, and, uh, and interestingly, people didn't, I don't know if I ever had anyone challenge the validity of the information, even though the data, even though I did have it well documented, people didn't seem to be too concerned. And that the involvement of the volunteers was an integral part of the show. Um, it was a community effort, and uh, in closing, it was tedious, difficult, obsessive, and probably the most rewarding thing I've done in my life. So, thank you. Thank you. Our second group of presenters will offer a mix of readings and performances. First, we'll hear from Eric Wright. Eric is a peace and social justice organizer. He's currently retired and living in Denver. He is an occasional songwriter and singer of songs for peace rallies and events of all kinds. Second, we'll hear from Patrick Malone. Patrick is a former protester who lived in the teepee located on the railroad tracks leading into Rocky Flats for most of the nine months of the 1978 occupation. He was one of the last two people arrested at the occupation. Mr. Malone was arrested at Rocky Flats 10 times and spent over six months in jail. He currently still has the TP. Ann Waldman has been a prolific and active poet, performer, editor, and teacher for many years. She is a founder of the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics and is the artistic director of its celebrated summer writing program. Her interests include radical hybrid forms for the long poem and documentary poetics, both of which fuel her commitments as a cultural activist. She is also the author of the Lovis Trilogy, Colors in the Mechanism of Concealment from 2011 a feminist cultural intervention into war and patriarchy, which won the Penn Center Award for Poetry in 2012. Fourth, we will hear from Tom Mayer. Tom is a sociologist who works in the fields of political economy, social class analysis, and mathematical sociology. He taught at CU Boulder for 40 years and retired in 2010. Mr. Mayer is a longtime activist for peace, social justice, and environmental sanity. He is currently active in the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. Finally, Kristen Iverson is an instructor of writing and an author. Her work has been published in the New York Times, The Nation, Reader's Digest, and elsewhere. She grew up near Rocky Flats and worked at the plant herself. Experiences which are depicted in her recent work of nonfiction full body burden. She holds a PhD from the University of Denver 
and currently directs the PhD program in nonfiction at the University of Cincinnati. bit of a break, an opportunity for participation. I'm counting on you. Uh, I came to Denver in 1978, and the main attraction that brought me here was my, now my wife, Judy Danielson, and uh, she was up to her ears in uh, Rocky Flats movement. And uh, so pretty soon I got involved in it, and in 1979 we put together a little book of songs to convert Rocky Flats. We charged 75 cents for it. Uh, I was struck when Brian was talking about the uh, functions of art, the ways we think. This was one he didn't mention. The songs in this collection, it's from the front inside cover, are intended for singing at rallies, meetings, marches, demonstrations, and gatherings, large and small. There are old songs and new songs, some made up about Rocky Flats, others that speak of our hopes for a peaceful world, they should make us feel stronger, part of a bigger movement of people everywhere working on to close the weapons plants and end the nuclear threat. So this particular one is called the Cow Song. It's a tune you all know, and the chorus is on the in the screen, I guess, on the screen. So uh, enjoy me. In the foothills of East Colorado Where the grass grows delicious and tall The cows all agree with each other They don't like radiation at all So they sing No nukes, no nukes No radioactive junk in my milk if you please No nukes, no nukes We'd rather make ice cream Cheese. Now the cows are our friends and our neighbors. They're part of the working class too. And because of the fruits of their labors, we put yogurt and butter for you and sing. No nukes, no nukes, no radioactive junk in my milk if they please. No nukes, no nukes. We'd rather make ice cream and cheese. You know, some people have trouble keeping a tune or remembering words, and you can just moo at the chorus. It goes, boo, boo, okay, okay. It adds to it. The cows are like most other women. As mothers, they work without pay. But as sisters united in struggle, they're working to see better days. Boo. No radioactive junk in my milk, if you please. No nukes, no nukes. We'd rather make ice cream and cheese. Now the cows don't like strontium-90. Yuck. They say that it curdles their cream. But they'll tumble the wealthy and mighty. Those cows have a socialist dream. No nukes. No nukes, no radioactive junk in my milk, if you please. No nukes, no nukes, we'd rather make ice cream and cheese. So Rockwell, stop making those triggers before we're all blown up or dead. And to use all the skills of your workers, you could make us new milk trucks instead. No nukes, no nukes, no radioactive junk in my milk, if you please. No nukes, no nukes, we'd rather make ice cream and cheese. At the next Rocky Flats demonstration, there'll be one more affinity group. And you'll know them by horns and by udders. They'll be our most militant troop, and as they drag them off to jail, they'll sing. No nukes, no nukes, no radioactive junk in my milk, if you please. No nukes, no nukes, we'd rather make ice cream and cheese.
Thank you. My name is Patrick Malone. Uh, occasionally people just refer to me as the teepee man. Tonight I'm going to give you a uh, cross-section of what's going on in my head. Um, uh, I met a wonderful man at a great restaurant called The Holding Cell. I met Allen Ginsberg there and we had a little time to talk. So we talked about all kinds of stuff and he got me interested in writing poetry. I didn't think I'd ever write poetry. So I started writing poetry and I started writing enough to write my own style. So I have my own style here. This is from one of my first works. It's called Secret Lover. Hold me now. Hold me to your breast. Hold me to your heart. Your heart beat soothes my soul. Your heartbeat hypnotizes my being. Your heartbeat calls to my spirit. My spirit yearns for your embrace. My spirit searches for your arms. My spirit wants you to hold me. My heart purrs when I'm in your embrace. My heart coos as I kiss your lips. My heart melts as we become entangled, entangled in the soft caress of arms and legs, entangled in the tango of loving, entangled in the heat of passion, passion fueled by our love, fashion, passion exploding from our fire, passion fulfilled as my heart purrs. In uh, the first Persian Gulf, I had the opportunity to do another little peace camp. In Athens, um, Georgia, they referred to me as the Archman because I lived under their state symbol, the Arch, for three months in a tent. Well, actually a month, they moved us aside. That was the Athens Peace Camp. And I'm gonna give you some poetry from there. Shadows etched in the sand. Shadows etched in the sidewalks. Sidewalks, shadows etched into the history. The history of war, the history of peace, the history of humanity. Humanity struggling for understanding, humanity struggling for justice, humanity struggling with its shadows. This is my favorite. Lonely vigil on a busy street. Lonely vigil in a busy world. Lonely vigil for peace. For peace in my heart, for peace in my world, for peace in my time. My time for saying no to war. My time for sitting quietly. My time for a lonely vigil. I decided to go on tour in 1991, and so after spending three months camped out at UGA, I went to Nevada to the test site, the Nevada test site, and wrote this poetry. Thunder rolling through the sky, thunder rolling through my heart, thunder rolling through the earth, the earth trembling with pain. The earth trembling with shame. I'll finish that one. At the end of the year, I had the opportunity to go to the Feast of the Holy Innocents at the um, uh, submarine base in Georgia. The kings are afraid of the truth. The kings are afraid of the people. 
the kings are afraid of the babies. The babies are innocent. The babies are the future. The babies are killed. Killed because the prophets have predicted. Killed because the truth is known. Killed because the kings are afraid. Poetry dripping from my pen. Poetry dripping from my soul. Poetry dripping from my heart. My heart filled with joy. My heart filled with sorrow. My heart filled with life. Life is thunder and lightning. Life is winter and summer. Life is poetry dripping. I am going to briefly explain to some people why I did what I did. This was the greatest place in the world to live. Now think about it. Look at all the sky. You've got the transportation available. And you have a teepee. Now, has anybody ever tried to live in a teepee? Well, yeah, for tens of thousands of years. How many of them have tried to live on the railroad tracks? Anywhere in the world? Nobody. Nobody has ever tried to live on the railroad tracks in anything. We lived on the railroad tracks for nine months. That led into a nuclear weapons plant. And you know who I have to thank for that? Jimmy Carter. Why? Because Jimmy Carter did not think we could stay there. Of course, Jimmy Carter did not meet me. And I will meet Jimmy Carter because I'm going to go back to Georgia and I'm going to say, Jimmy, we need to talk. So in closing, oh, I, I got arrested 10 times, blah, blah. There's a great book blah, blah. One of the things that's really great about it is the arrest record that shows that we had people arrested every, every time the train came. Somebody was there every time the train came to do something. We were right there in the cold, in the winter, we were there saying, not without somebody stopping you, train. Not without somebody. And I want to thank the hundreds of millions of people who helped us by simply thinking about us. The people in Europe were thinking, what are those goofy people on the tracks doing? I can tell you, there was a lot of people in Boulder saying that. What are those people doing out there? Well, Jimmy Carter let me go there, and I stayed as long as he would let me. And I'm going to tell you, it was hard. God dang hard. Cold, 25 below zero. Have you ever had to go to the bathroom 25 below zero? I'm telling you, that is hard. And 60 mile an hour winds, you don't walk 60 mile an hour winds. You crawl to the bathroom with that. But I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. I'm going to do something that has probably not been done here in a long time. I'm going to chant for you. I hope I can get through this. If you guys are familiar with the chant, you can chant in.
What an honor to be here, an incredible panel and presentations. Very, very powerful, very evocative, and clearly it's not over yet. And uh, when Allen Ginsberg and I came in 1974 to found the Jack Kerouac School at Naropa University, the first Buddhist-inspired university on this continent, uh, we were certainly aware of Rocky Flats, not to the extent that we became aware. And um, some of the people in our community, the poets and artists and students, uh, came out and started joining with the activities of the Peace and Justice Center and others uh, around, of course, when Daniel Ellsberg came and uh, rested. We were trying to figure out when that first time was, probably 78. I think there was an August arrest and so on. So there's a lot of history there. And certainly Rocky Flats has haunted my work and my life for a number of years. Um, I continue to live part of the year in Colorado, in South Boulder, not far from the site, which is still, still quite toxic and dangerous for walking your dog, taking your children in carriages and so on, uh, should be permanently closed, and I invoke often Joanna Macy's view of, you know, the guardianship project. Maybe some of you know about that. You can find out more about that, that people would be trained to uh, actually take care of the site and, and also be an information center. This show here is very powerful. I haven't had time to look at it in detail, but I plan to come back. It's so important, this kind of documentation. So um, I'll start with a little chant of my own written for protest at the site, and then I'll read some from uh, Allen Ginsberg's poem, Plutonian Ode. You heard a little bit of the Phil Glass music in the beginning. And um, just to say that I worked on a epic poem, it's a thousand pages, uh, which includes Rocky Flats, and includes a chant of my son's when he was about seven, eight years old, of ways to cover up plutonium. Let's cover up plutonium with chewing gum wrappers. Let's cover it up with Congolium, let's cover it up with all the cigarettes in the world, and so on. And I actually read that at one of the uh, open meetings, hoping to convince the other side. <laughs> and I really appreciated that way that we were least able to present and we're in the room with people who disagreed uh, and had different points of view. But um, anyway, a lot of faith in the community that, that worked so hard and help close it down. Of course, it, as, as I said, it still goes on and there's activity continuing. Mega, 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 mega. Mega, mega, mega death bomb in light end. I dedicate this day against mega death. This Plutos wealth plus Archaea rule. This rule of the wealthy, this Plutolatry, I speak Fell away, mega, 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 death bomb, enlighten. Junk plutonium, love it, hate it, we'll all be glowing for a quarter of a million years. Teeth glowing, underwear glowing, pages of words glowing, ah, the lumbar glowing in pain, and eyeballs glowing. Poor sad monster eyeballs reincarnated for a quarter of a million years. And we would go out with these, actually that was inspired by seeing a, a jar of mega vitamins on Allen Ginsberg's counter. We were heading out in a big truckload of poets from Naropa in the summer. Allen had his poem and I was trying to think of something on the spot and I saw that word mega. So that was sometimes, you know, these little things can unlock a, a phrase. Plutonian ode, I'll read part of this one. Ayan Ginsberg. What new element before us, unborn in nature? Is there a new thing under the sun? At last, inquisitive Whitman's, a modern epic, detonative scientific theme, first penned unmindful by Dr. Seberg with poisonous hands, named for death's planet through the sea beyond Uranus, whose chthonic ore fathers, this magma teared Lord of Hades, sire of avenging furies, billionaire hell king, worshiped once with black sheep throats cut, 
priest's face averted from underground mysteries in single temple at Eleusis, spring green Persephone nuptialed to his inevitable shade, Demeter, mother of asphodel weeping dew, her daughter stored in salty caverns under white snow, black hail, gray winter rain or polar ice, immemorable seasons before fish flew in heaven, before ram died by starry bush, before the bull stamped sky and earth, or twins inscribed the memories in clay, or crabbed flood-washed memory from the skull, or lion sniffed the lilac breeze in Eden, before the great year began turning its 12 signs, Year constellations wheeled for 24,000 sunny years, slowly round their axis in Sagittarius, 167,000 times returning to this night. Radioactive nemesis, were you there at the beginning? Black, dumb, tongueless, unsmelling blast of disillusion? I manifest your baptismal word after four billion years. I guess your birthday in earthling night. I salute your dreadful presence, last majestic as the gods. Sabaoth, Jehovah, Astephilius, Adonais, Elohim. Yaldabaoth, aeon from aeon born ignorant in an abyss of light. Sophia's reflections glittering thoughtful galaxies, whirlpools of star spume silver thin as hairs of Einstein. Father Whitman, I celebrate a matter that renders self oblivion, grand subject that annihilates inky hands and pages, prayers, old orators, inspired immortalities. I begin your chant, open mouthed, exhaling into spacious sky over silent mills at Hanford, Savannah River, Rocky Flats, Pantex, Burlington, Albuquerque. I yell through Washington, South Carolina, Colorado, Texas, Iowa, New Mexico, where nuclear reactors create a new thing under the sun, where Rockwell war plants fabricate this death stuff trigger in nitrogen baths. Hanger Silas Mason assembles the terrified weapon secret by 10,000s and where Manzano Mountain boasts to store its dreadful decay through 240 millennia while our galaxy spirals around its nebulous core. I enter your secret places with my mind. I speak with your presence. I roar your your lion roar with mortal mouth, one microgram inspired to one lung, 10 pounds of heavy metal dust adrift slow motion over gray Alps, the breadth of the planet. How long before your radiance speeds blight and death to sentient beings? Enter my body or not, I carol my spirit inside you, unapproachable weight. Oh, heavy, heavy element, awakened, I vocalize your consciousness to six worlds. I chant your absolute vanity, yea, monster of anger birthed in fear. Oh, most ignorant matter overcreated, unnatural to earth, delusion of metal empires destroyer of lying scientists, devourer of covetous generals, incinerator of armies and melter of wars, judgment of judgments, divine wind over vengeful nations, molester of presidents, death scandal of capital politics, ah, civilization stupidly industrious, canker hex on multitudes learned or illiterate, Manufactured specter of human reason, oh, solidified image of practitioner in black arts, I dare your reality, I challenge your very being, I publish your cause and effect, I turn the wheel of mind on your 300 tons, your name enters mankind's ear, I embody your ultimate powers, my oratory advances on your vaulted mystery, this breath dispels your braggart fears, I sing your form at last behind your concrete and iron walls inside your fortress of rubber and translucent silicon shields in filtered cabinets and baths of lathe oil. My voice resounds through ro robot glove boxes and ingot cans and echoes in electric vaults inert of atmosphere. I enter with spirit out loud into your fuel rod drums underground on soundless thrones and beds of lead. Oh, density. 
This weightless anthem trumpets transcended through hidden chambers and breaks through iron doors in the infernal room over your dreadful vibration. This measured harmony floats audible. These jubilant tones are honey and milk and wine, sweet water poured on the stone black floor. These syllables are barley groats I scatter on the reactor's core. I call your name with hollow vowels. I psalm your fate close by, my breath near deathless ever at your side to spell your destiny. I set this verse prophetic on your mausoleum walls to seal you up eternally with diamond truth. Oh, doomed plutonium. To the bard surveys Plutonian history from midnight lit with mercury vapor street lamps still in dawn's early light. He contemplates a tranquil poetic spaced out between nations, thought forms proliferating bureaucratic and horrific armed satanic industries projected sudden with $500 billion strength around the world. Same time this text is set in Boulder, Colorado before front range of Rocky Mountains, 12 miles north of Rocky Flats nuclear facility in the United States of North America, Western Hemisphere of planet Earth, six months and 14 days around our solar system in a spiral galaxy. Three, this ode to you, O poets and orators to come, you, Father Whitman, as I join your side, you, Congress and American people, you, present meditators, spiritual friends and teachers, you, O oh, master of the diamond arts, take this wheel of syllables in hand, these vowels and consonants to breath's end. Take this inhalation of black poison to your heart. Breathe out this blessing from your breast on our oration, forests, cities, oceans, deserts, rocky flats and mountains in the ten directions pacify with exhalation enrich this plutonian ode to explode its empty thunder through earthen thought worlds magnetize this howl with heartless compassion destroy this mountain of plutonium with ordinary mind and body speech thus empower this mind guard spirit gone out gone out Gone beyond, gone beyond me, wake space, so, ah. Ellen Ginsberg, thank you. I'm Tom Mayer. I'm on this panel because I am the author of a musical about Rocky Flats. And I'd like to just say a few words about how I came to write that musical, and I'll tell, give you a synopsis uh, of it. Uh, as uh, Brian said, I'm a professional sociologist. I taught at the University of Michigan for, no, no, no. I taught at the University of Michigan, but the University of Colorado for, uh, for 40 uh, years. And I worked in social class and political economy and mathematical sociology. I've also been a peace and justice activist since I was a teenager, and I'm a socialist and a Marxist. I was particularly active in the struggle against the US intervention in Vietnam. I went to jail on that behalf, and I have written numerous poems, songs, and short plays, but I really don't consider myself an artist, so I'm a little bit embarrassed to be in this company of, uh, of artists. I, my poems and plays always had a political motivation or celebrating some, uh, some person or event, like the marriage of a, of a son or daughter. Uh, why, let me say more specifically about why I came to write Rocky Flats, a musical, a nuclear musical. Uh, I was very worried about the possibility of nuclear war, and frankly, I am still worried about the possibility of nuclear war. I did not at all believe in the mutual assured destruction outlook. Um, I suggest that uh, Ken Freiberg read uh, uh, Gar Albowitz's classic uh, work, Atomic Diplomacy, Hiroshima and, Notstam, and Potsdam, disabuse him of the views which he expressed earlier today, which in my mind are entirely erroneous. Um, I was worried more personally about the future of my own children and my wife. Uh, my children were then fairly young, um, and uh, that gave a much more personal dimension to it. 
I was also disappointed that the end of the Vietnam War did not lead to a significant reduction in the Cold War. I had hoped that the end of that war would lead to a reduction in the, uh, in the Cold War, but it, it didn't. I was disturbed that, that most Americans uh, um, seemed to be unaware or unconcerned about the danger of nuclear war. And I frankly wanted to do something that alerted people about that uh, danger. My experience in the anti-Vietnam uh, uh, war movement suggested that drama could be effective, and so I set about writing a musical about Rocky Flats. I already partic participated in many Rocky Flats uh, demonstrations uh, and was active in organizing them. I originally wrote the uh, musical to folk music, uh, but when we put it into production, the, the uh, director suggested that we compose a, a original music for it, and so we found uh, Newell Kring, who wrote original music for the uh, words which I, and story which I had written. Let me just summarize this, uh, this, the nuclear musical story so you get an idea of what it was. Uh, I tried to imagine a situation w which could actually lead to a nuclear war. So in my story here, uh, an, intelligent ref uh, report, uh, an intelligence report informs the president that the Soviet Union is about to launch a dangerous uh, killer, killer satellite system with new neutron weapons. The president decides to launch a preemptive strike uh, on the Soviet system before that system can be launched. This requires rapid re uh, production of a special nuclear warhead, much of it which would, would be produced at Rocky Flats. Meanwhile, the anti-Rocky Flat demonstrators are debating about what tactics to use. The majority want a peaceful, peaceful non-confrontational confrontational uh, demonstration, a minority wants to do civil disobedience, and a tiny group egged on by an agent provocateur uh, wants to sabotage the Rocky Flats uh, uh, plant, and this leads in the, to an intense controversy. The speed up necessita necessitated by the special nuclear warhead causes accidents at the Rocky Flat plant. Workers debate whether to shoulder the increased risks or to go on strike. A confrontation between the workers and the demonstrators uh, ensues. Fights break out and several demonstrators are beaten up. Uh, demonstrators are then divided about whether to remain nonviolent when being physically attacked or to respond in kind. When further accidents occur, Rocky Flats workers decide to go on strike. Despite their previous conflict, the demonstrators volunteer to help the striking workers. The strikers accept the help from the demonstrators. Then the president learns that the intelligence reports were, were, he had received were faulty and that the, the Soviet Union is not about to launch a killer satellite system. He therefore calls off the accelerated uh, production of the special nuclear warhead. The striking workers win their safety demands. Workers and demonstrators celebrate this victory jointly. The future relations at the end of the musical between workers and demonstrators remain uncertain, as does the overall future of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. That's the basic story which is told in the, uh, in the nuclear musical. Um, we did this 12 times in 1980, uh, four, eight times in Boulder, four times in, uh, in uh, Denver. And I think as a whole, the, the, uh, the uh, public's reaction was quite good. Let me read you a letter which I received about the musical from Florence uh, Becker Lennon, who you may remember, she was a poet, an author, a, a peace activist, and, and feminist. She wrote this at the age of 85, and here's what she, she uh, wrote to me at that time. She said, uh, Dear Tom Mayer, it was a great pleasure to experience the first night of your, of your excellent opera. In fact, it was so good that I really want to make it still better, and that is why I am writing to you. The trouble with it is the end. You know perfectly well that there would not be a happy ending. The rest of the play is so real, so perceptive, that you, merely, that you surely know that the militia came in and shot them up. All, 
all of a sudden, this honest portrait of the class struggle turns into a musical comedy with a happy ending. You know better than that, and so does your audience. We applauded out of relief, but we are, we're kidding ourselves, too. Weren't you there at the Ludlow's massacre, at Kent State, at, at uh, lots of other places? You know better, and so do we. I don't see any truthful and happy solution, and I resent being treated like a child or an ignoramus. The music, the, the, the music was excellent, too. Much to my delight, I had expected some hideous rock on music. Uh, uh, the production, too, was professional. My one complaint is that you chickened out at the end, and your good militant characters must be as angry with you as I am. <laughs> Best wishes, Florence Becker Lennon, professional nitpicker. <laughs> so... I'd like to just conclude with the three uh, uh, observations uh, now many years after the nuclear um, musical. I think that the anti-nuclear demonstrators deserve immense credit for the eventual closing of the Rocky Flats plant. I think that they, their, their contribution has perhaps not been adequately recognized in this uh, event. I'm thinking about the Rocky, the Rocky Flats Truth Force from 1978 onward. I'm thinking about the Rocky Flats Encirclement of 1982, three. I'm thinking about the numerous other demonstrations which called the, Rocky, the existence of Rocky Flats and its activities to the public attention. They transformed the political environment in which, the Rocky, in which Rocky Flats existed. My second point. The main political change which made possible the closing of Rocky Flats was the winding down and eventual ending of the, of the Cold War. For this momentous change, everyone on this planet owes an immense debt to Mikhail S. Gorbachev, the single person most responsible for the ending and winding down of the Cold War. Thirdly, the world escaped nuclear confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union, but we are still gravely threatened by nuclear warfare. As long as nuclear weapons exist and as long as nations have the freedom to declare war, the threat of nuclear war hangs like a sword of Damocles over the collective head of humanity. The horrendous dilemma which I addressed in by nuclear flats and nuclear musical is unfortunately still very relevant. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here today. I know it's been a long day and this has been a long session and I, th I thank you all for your attention. Um, I cannot tell you how delighted, how privileged and honored I feel to be here today and to be part of what's happening here this weekend. Um, I do think that this is possibly the first time that we have had an honest and open dialogue about Rocky Flats. This is the kind of conversation that we have needed uh, here in this community for a long, long time. We've spent a lot of time this weekend talking about the past and reflecting upon all the things that happened at Rocky Flats, but we have a living legacy here, uh, an environmental legacy, a historical legacy, and a public health issue that uh, is very much with us to the present day. And if we are to address it effectively, we have to be able to we have to have the courage and the open-mindedness to look this story straight in the face. And I think that's what's going on this weekend, and I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, my name is Kristen Iverson. Uh, I wrote a book about two years ago entitled Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. This is a work of nonfiction. Uh, it is a blend of journalism and memoir. Uh, ten years of research and writing went into this book. It's very heavily footnoted. 
In fact, when it was published, there were so many footnotes that my editor at Random House, which I happen to have the same editor at, that uh, President Obama had for his books, very uh, honored to work with her, but she emailed me back and she said, we can't publish this. This is a book of footnotes with a little bit of story. <laughs> so the book um, that, that you can buy today is actually only about a third of the footnotes. Um, the book was very heavily footnoted and fact-checked. Uh, when it came out in the United States two years ago, it went through the legal department at Random House in New York. Very shortly after that, it came out in the United Kingdom and it went through the legal department uh, uh, there in London. It just came out in China about a month ago and it's about to come out in Japan. I wasn't sure how the world would respond to this book. It's a very controversial story. Uh, but the world has uh, o uh, responded in, in an overwhelming fashion. I've spent the two years, the last two years since this book came out, um, living out of a suitcase, traveling all over the country and all over the world, talking about Rocky Flats and what happened here and how important it is. And it's interesting to me as I speak, uh, people in other places, people in other countries, uh, generally know more about Rocky Flats than those of us here in Colorado. People in Edinburgh, Scotland, when I spoke at the Literary Festival there recently, knew more about Rocky Flats than uh, most of the people in this community, I would suspect. I find that very interesting. Um, this story uh, is essentially uh, three narratives. Um, I came to this story as a writer, a journalist, a historian, a mother, um, and also a former Rocky Flats worker and a child of this land. I grew up here. Uh, most of my family and friends still live here, and I feel deeply connected to this land. This is my home. Um, and so I came to this story uh, with a very uh, unique perspective, and yet not so unique, because I think I represent the stories of a lot of people who live here and who have lived this story. And that was my intention with this book, was to tell the story of Rocky Flats through the eyes of the people who lived it. People. Uh, who grew up in my neighborhood, my family, uh, my siblings, my co-workers at Rocky Flats, other people who live in the area, uh, the activists, so many different people. Rocky Flats has impacted all of our lives in so many different ways, and I wanted to tell the story as fully as possible. So what I'm going to do today, I don't have a lot of time, uh, but um, I'm going to tell you the story that I uh, uh, tell in this book through um, pictures, a kind of a, a shortened version of, of the normal kind of presentation that I do, and, um, and then I have a few comments at the end. Uh, so, um, this is, I, I'm going to show you a couple of family pictures. I do think that the most powerful way to tell this story is through personal stories, through the lives of the workers, the residents, the families. I could talk about plutonium for half an hour. We've been talking a lot about plutonium here and put you all to sleep in about three minutes. But when I start telling you about how plutonium has affected the lives of workers and residents and the people who live here, it takes on a very different um, caliber of meaning. So uh, this is a picture of my family, um, but just before my brother, uh, many, uh, my family is here this weekend. I'm very honored that they're here. I appreciate their support. Um, this is a picture that was taken uh, not long, my brother came along not long after this. We had our first house in Old Town, Arvada, uh, down by the pizza parlor there. And uh, then when, uh, when I was about 11 years old, uh, we moved out to Bridaldale, which is a subdivision, one of the new, was one of the new subdivisions out near Rocky Flats. Of course, we had no idea what Rocky Flats was. We had never heard of it. Uh, our first house was about seven miles or so from the plant, and uh, we lived there until I was 11. We moved out to our new house, which was about three miles from the plant, uh, just before the May 11th, 1969 fire. One other thing I want to mention about my family is um, uh, I grew up in a very Scandinavian family. Uh, my family is Norwegian and Danish, and we were raised with the idea that uh, my mother used to say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Um, but I don't think this is a particularly Scandinavian thing. I think a lot of people grew up with this idea. And one of the things that this book is about is about the cost of secrecy and silencing, and what happens 
whether we're talking about family dynam dynamics or nuclear weapons plans. What happens when you can't talk about things? What is the cost of secrecy and silencing at the level of family, at the level of community, at the level of government? This photo was taken uh, at our first house. This photo was taken uh, from the backyard of our second house. Uh, we could see the Rocky Flats water tower from our back porch. We did not know what went on out there. We had no idea. When I was a kid, the plant was operated by Dow Chemical. The rumor in the neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. Uh, for years, my mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles. They were not making scrubbing bubbles. A lot of the people in our neighborhood worked at Rocky Flats. As I mentioned, I later went to work at the plant myself, like a lot of kids in my neighborhood. People could not talk about the work that they did. You couldn't tell your family what you did. Uh, workers in one part of the plant didn't know what workers in another part of the plant were doing. So there were a lot of rumors about what actually went on at Rocky Flats, from glass doorknobs to stringless yo-yos, you know, uh, all sorts of things. Some of that was misinformation provided by the plant. Um, and some of it was, a, can, can, you, can you imagine, I'm sure this is true for many of the people in this room, you work at a, at a place for 10 or 20 or 30 years and you come home in the evening, you cannot tell your family what you did at work all day. Uh, so people would make things up. And I think that's where a lot of the rumors came from. Rocky Flats was not making scrubbing bubbles. Beginning in 1952, uh, production of nuclear weapons began. It was owned by the Atomic Energy Commission, now the DOE, and operated, as I mentioned, by Dow Chemical and later Rockwell. When I worked at the plant, it was operated by EG&G. From 1952 to 1989, Rocky Flats produced more than 70,000 plutonium pits or triggers. And some of what I'm going to say has been mentioned earlier on the panel, so I'm, I'm just going to give you kind of an abbreviated version. Uh, each one of these uh, plutonium pits or triggers, and it, that's a little bit of a euphemism. A better way to think about it, I think, is that we produce the heart of the nuclear bomb. We produce the heart of nuclear weapons here in Arvada. Uh, each one of these pits contains enough breathable particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth. The uh, plutonium for uh, the, but uh, the buttons, the uh, plutonium for the buttons came from Hanford, and Oak Ridge supplied the enriched uranium. Once these buttons were machined at Rocky Flats, they were transported to the Pantex facility in Texas, where, where they were encased in conventional explosives and actually became the bomb. When I worked at Rocky Flats, some of the workers that I knew who had worked in the hot area and worked directly on the line, uh, one of the things that they would sometimes say is that, well, you know, those who did, who were aware of what was going on, you know, um, we weren't actually making the bombs here. They were, were just making the part, and they actually made them in, in Texas. <laughs> so there are a lot of ways to kind of rationalize and look at what it was that we were doing. Work, as I mentioned, workers were not allowed to talk about their work to anyone, including their families. Uh, this is a shot of the production, heart of the production uh, facility. And I like this picture because it has a shot of the barbed wire. My sisters, my brother and I, we would ride our horses down along Elk Hire and in Indiana, uh, along those barbed wire fences. We rode our horses all around the fields of Rocky Flats. We swam in Stanley Lake uh, with our dogs and with our horses. Stanley Lake is contaminated with plutonium. We had no idea that the environment was contaminated. Here's an aerial view of the plant. I know many of you have seen this. Normally, at this point, I pause and talk a little bit about some of the contamination issues, but uh, I'm going to um, move on. Uh, here's a shot of the glove box line. Uh, workers stood uh, on uh, the floor or on boxes. Uh, the glove box line is how the is, glove boxes is where they actually, um, oh, I deleted that photo, but, um, Workers would put, as many of you know, would put their hands and arms into lead-lined gloves and uh, work with the plutonium buttons and then uh, move it down the line. So it was a, literally a conveyor belt, like a, um, literally a factory. Plutonium storage at Rocky Flats, uh, storage was always an issue. Uh, there was a lot of material stored on site, inside buildings. Here's a shot of workers. Um, moving materials, working with the materials in the barrels. I never worked uh, in the hot areas at Rocky Flats. I never wanted to, although I had a lot of friends who did. 
What I did at Rocky Flats was I worked as an administrative uh, assistant, a writer, a technical writer, and I would meet with um, project managers and engineers to, put to, to compile reports that were then sent on to uh, Washington, D.C. and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I want to uh, uh, show you a couple of photos um, that I think are important with respect to what's been talked about at this conference here today. This is a shot of the uh, Building 771 um, incinerator. There were a number of things that happened at Rocky Flats that led to the FBI raid that we are commemorating this weekend. Uh, I want to emphasize that the FBI, FBI raid was the only time in the history of our country, as far as I know, the two government agencies, the FBI and the EPA, have raided another government agency, the Department of Energy. Uh, one of the things that they were concerned about was the incineration of radioactive and toxic waste. Um, this particular, the, the incinerator attached to Building 771 um, incinerated waste that uh, traveled over the Metro Denver area. There were a number of issues with groundwater, pond creek, which has been talked about a little bit, and other things that led to the raid. The Department of Energy, uh, previously the AEC, Dow and Rockwell, continuously denied that Rocky Flats was involved in nuclear activities or posed any danger to the public. I want to show you this particular map. Um, everything that I'm showing you is based on Department of Energy information. Many of these charts and maps have been used in litigation related to Rocky Flats, and they are publicly available. This is a very interesting map of known waste and burial sites at Rocky Flats. It also implies, of course, unknown waste and burial sites at Rocky Flats. From this map here, you can see how Walnut Creek flows into Great Western Reservoir. Uh, which, as been, has been mentioned earlier, had a problem with tritium. Uh, and then Woman Creek flows into Stanley Lake. Stanley Lake has a problem with plutonium. This is a shot of an infinity room. An infinity room uh, is an area at the plant where an incident or accident occurred, where the contamination uh, was so profound that the room had to be sealed off and can never uh, be opened again. This is a particularly interesting room because uh, it shows uh, a jackhammer and um, some tubing in there, and it looks like an old mine shaft, uh, except, of course, it's highly radioactive. And one of the issues that they had to uh, deal with during the cleanup was what to do with these infinity rooms. I want to take just a moment and talk about some of the fires at Rocky Flats. Over the course of 38 years, there were hundreds of fi fires at Rocky Flats. There was never any um, public uh, warning or evacuation, very little information available to the public. The first, uh, I'm sorry, the two biggest fires were in 1957 and 1969. The 1957 fire was so extreme that it burned out all of the filters and it burned out the measuring equipment. Uh, so we will never know exactly how much radioactive and toxic contamination uh, escaped during that fire. This is a shot of the burned out filters. These were filters that had not been changed in four years. So were the, there, was, um, there was a lot of material in those filters. This is the plume of that 1957 fire. It's probably a little bit hard to see. Um, if I had a pointer, I could point to you where our house is, kind of right in that red center. Uh, and where we are right now today is in uh, one of these areas, obviously. The uh, Mother's Day fire in 1969 traveled a very similar path. Um, on May 11th, 1969, when this fire occurred, uh, it was on Mother's Day, and our family, we were out having Mother's Day brunch. We had no idea that there was a fire at the plutonium factory just down the road and that there was a radioactive cloud traveling over our head. I want to mention the barrels. More than 5,000 barrels stood out in the open for more than 11 years. These barrels contained radioactive and toxic waste. Our house is just off the left side of that screen, a couple of miles. What happened with those barrels? They rusted out. Radioactive and toxic material leaked into the soil, contaminated the, gro the groundwater, and was carried off site. The public was not informed. Contaminants included plutonium, tritium, strontium. Strontium was detected in the bones of horses in our neighborhood. Americium, carbon tetrachloride, beryllium, dioxin, and uranium. 
Uh, and these are some of the VOCs, volatile organic comp compounds, that we also were exposed to. I'm running a little bit close on time, so I'm going to skip up to a few more people pictures here and then close. This is a shot of my uh, brother and one of our dogs. Animals are a very important part of the story. It's in the animals where we first begin to see some of the health effects of Rocky Flats. This picture is important to me because it shows the land and how open the land is. Uh, the wind comes down off the mountains, those high moving Chinook winds, and they pick up contaminants from the site, and this occurs to the present day and carry it over into neighborhoods. Now, the main difference here is that this neighborhood is now, uh, it doesn't look like this at all anymore. There's much more development. Here's a shot of Dr. Carl Johnson. Um, and we talked about him earlier, and I just want to mention, he was fired from his job for opposing home development near Rocky Flats. He later won a whistleblower lawsuit. That's part of the story that a lot of people don't uh, remember necessarily or don't know. This is a map of contaminated residential areas around Rocky Flats. Um, there is a detailed map. This is available on the web. You can see it on a street-by-street -street basis. This is a local farmer who had deformities in his animals, pigs, cows, horses. This scooter pig, uh, this pig scooter, uh, was born with no back legs, and Lloyd Mixon was one of the first, uh, I guess we'll use the word, activist, who would show up at meetings and say, tell us what is happening at Rocky Flats. Cattle near Rocky Flats have showed high plutonium levels in the lungs. I, we, I don't have time to talk about the raid uh, in detail, and many other people have covered that this weekend. Um, I'm going to end by talking about some of the people that I talk about in my book. Many workers, as you know, became ill. One of those workers was Charlie Wolf, uh, a person that I knew and worked with and was fortunate to interview many times. Some people get sick immediately. For others, it takes a long time. Some people never get sick at all. Uh, Charlie uh, had worked at Rocky Flats. He developed brain tumors, and uh, he passed away in 2009. Very sad. Uh, I want to mention um, the workers who have been so vocal, including uh, Laura Schultz, who uh, has been very ill, but spends a lot of her time, when she has the time and energy, talking about workers uh, and how important it is to recognize their health uh, issues and how many workers have, been, uh, have gotten sick and died. And I also want to talk about you know, what I feel uh, is, the, is one of the great untold stories of Rocky Flats, and that is what has happened to the residents in this area. You hear a lot of talk about how there is no contamination or whatever levels are there are safe. I want you to hear the story from a different point of view. This is uh, one of the people that I talk about in my book is Tamara Smith Mesa, who lived just down the road from us. Um, we knew her family because our pony, Barney, would crawl under the fence and go over to their garden and eat all their vegetables. And I'd have to go over in the morning before school and get Barney and bring him back. And Tamara's father would come out and say, get your horse out of our garden. Um, the reason why they had such a great garden was that they uh, is an organic garden. They lived off the land as a Mormon family. They raised their own cattle. Um, one difference between our family and their family is that uh, our dad tried to dig a well and never got water. That family had a well, that, uh, and they live right on Stanley Lake, uh, went uh, down into that. Tamara Smith Mesa has had surgery for... Uh, several brain tumors, I believe uh, eight or nine at this point. She wasn't expected to survive the first one. She's an incredibly strong and courageous person. Um, she's very much weakened, but her, um, her, uh, the part of her brain um, with her language skills is, is intact, and she's very articulate. Her doctors in Colorado and New York have no doubt that her health effects have to do with Rocky Flats. And I'm going to end with this slide here. Uh, of course, we all grew up with many stories about illnesses, cancers uh, in our neighborhood. Veterinarians have reported for years a higher level of cancer in dogs in particular. Since my book came out, I have been inundated with emails from people who are sick uh, and their animals are sick and their children are sick. And this is not a historical story. This is not from 1952 or 1962 or 1975. This is something that's ongoing to the present day. I'm currently working with a group to take all of these stories and put them into a database called the Rocky Flats Story Project. And uh, we feel that these stories uh, should be made available 
that people need to know that this happened. There's uh, part of the art exhibit downstairs has a little bit to do with this. And so I'm just going to end by saying, th by thanking you again for your time. And um, I want to, I think I want to say uh, in summary that, you know, um, part of the story here, this is a story in a history of, of failure, of failed safety, failed communication, a failed cleanup. It is only a partial cleanup, and we have to remember that. Um, and further, Rocky Flats is not just a local story. Um, it's a national and a global story. It's the same story we've heard and we are hearing at Chernobyl, at Fukushima. Uh, it's a story of secrets and cover-up, of denial and deceit. And the rest of the world is watching us. They're watching to see what's happening with Rocky Flats and how we deal with how we deal with this legacy and how willing we are to tell the full story of what happened right here in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Would you please um, join me in offering a round of applause to all the participants again, please.